Okay, so yes, I come from Alang Solutions. Um, we didn't invent cloud computing, at least not the name anyway. The name came afterwards. Yeah, so we've been hearing a lot at this conference and other conferences about these fantastic new ideas. I mean, there's processes and actors and reactive programming and messaging and stuff like this. So we thought the best way to get into this is get ahead, right? And we decided we'd go back in history to do this. So we went back in history about 30 years and started looking at these new ideas then to work out so we could get, it for, get ahead on them. Right? So when we come up now, we would be well aware of everything that's going on, how to do it. So this is what we're doing. So getting back here, well, why Alang? Why did we want Alang? Why invent yet another language? Even 30 years ago, there were a lot of languages. So why do another one, right? And this came back to the type of problems we were looking at um, our problem domain. And this is from a thesis my boss at those time wrote. Um, a lot of interesting about the type of problems we were looking at, we were going to look at. Now some of these, well a lot of points here, but some are especially interesting. So for, for example, we start from the bottom. Even in those days, our system had to handle a lot of concurrent activities. With thinking switches, you might have easily have hundreds of thousands of lines, tens of thousands of calls going on at the same time, plus all the other activity. It had to be fault tolerant. Yes, you might lose a call occasionally, but the system must never crash. That just wasn't acceptable. Okay. Um, it had to be reconfigurable while it was running, even upgrading software while things were running. Again, the system must never go down, not for trivial things like upgrading the code or stuff like that. And you had the requirement that actions had to be performed at certain times or within certain times. Okay. There were, there were very, very hard requirements about this, that when something happened, you had to have a reaction within a certain time. And this just wasn't negotiable. So the system could never block, ever, anywhere. Right? So Erlang, the language and the system around it, our ideas for building the system, were designed to solve this type of problem. That's what we were after, right? So we had ideas from the language, we had ideas how the language would be used and how the primitives in the language would be used. So the reason Alang has the primitives it does is because this was, we found these were very useful for designing these type of systems. And Alang, the OTP, it provides direct support for solving these issues, for building systems with these issues. Yes, we have a lot of concurrency. Yes, we have to have fault tolerance. No, well, yes, we have to do things within certain times. This system must never block and all these type of things. There's direct support for doing all this. How do I build this stuff for it? Now we get on, the interesting thing here is we have what we call the Alang ecosphere. So on top of the Alang system, the Beam, which is the virtual machine here, and the Alang OTP libraries, which provide support for all these features, we are running, or well, there are running now, a number of different languages on these systems. Alang, of course, naturally. Um, a relatively new one that's come up is Elixir, which has become very interesting uh, on the website. We have LFE, for those who like Lisp, me. Uh, to do this, we have a Prolog, we have a Lua system, we have Joxa, which is another Lisp, and all these are running on top of the Alang system, using all the features of the Alang system. And by following, I'd say, the rules of how to do things, all these languages can easily, openly interact with each other. There are no limitations. I don't have to pick one language to do my system. I can use any of these languages. I can use multiple versions. I can use multiple languages on the system because the interaction between them is very, very well defined and easy to do. Right? We can talk with the outside world. We have another system here, the weirdo thing in grey, and there are interaction mechanisms for t for, the, for the system to integrate. And because the, the prim these primitives are built into the system itself, into the beam Alang OTP level, all the languages running on the, on the ecosphere, in the ecosphere, can access them and communicate with the outside world. 
Just because I'm using one language doesn't mean I have to do it myself because it's already there, right? Now, the interesting with the thing with the JVM, we do actually have an extra mechanism there. Because one of the things you can run on the JVM is Arjung, which is an implementation, a real implementation of Erlang on the JVM. And if you're using that, we can use Erlang's own distribution mechanisms to communicate with them, not just running over the J over, uh, having the, um, the standard mechanisms for doing that. If you're interested in Erlang on the J JVM, Arjung's the way to go, right? So why is this interesting? So, so why is Erlang relevant? I mean, we had all these things, with properties of the system we were trying to look at, right? We're trying to solve. Now, if you look at those properties, you'll find there's absolutely nothing about telecoms in there. There is no telecom-specific feature there at all. So, yes, they do describe telecom systems, but there's nothing telecom-specific in there. And that the same thing reflects on the Erlang and the OTP system on the beam. There is nothing telecom-specific about it. It's, sold, it's useful for building systems which have these issues, these problems, but there's nothing telecom-specific about it. And what has happened is that these type of problems, people have realized they are actually very general. There are many different type of systems which have these properties, which have these issues. So in one sense, the rest of the world has caught up with us in realizing that these things are actually important. And we were just out... By going back, we're out very early, designing a language, a system, a set of design patterns, rules for building these type of applications, these type of systems, right? So, so that's why um, Erlang is still relevant, or it is relevant. It's even actually even more relevant now than it was before. So I just want to wind up with one thing here. Uh, there's an Erlang user conference here in September. Please come. You are all invited. Um, if you come now, we have we can give you a slight discount price for it as well, too. So that's basically what I had to say. And I made the time. Hooray! Yes. <laughs> so any questions for Robert? Yes? Um, so a core feature of Erlang is hot code reloading. Uh, these days, it would seem there's a lot more talk about immutable uh, containers and deployments. Uh, Um, okay, there are cases you, you need both. Okay, there are cases where you cannot do that type of de other other type of deployment. You, you, I have one system. I cannot take take the system down if I have to have to upgrade it. Many cases you can do that. I mean, if I'm running multiple servers, I can do um, hot loading. I can just do hot loading and things like this for it. But there are still cases where you do need the, the do need the, the code reloading code on the running system. Get that to work. And it does work. It's not always easy, but it does work. And when you do it, it has a very well-defined semantics of how it works. So you can use it. Any other questions? It's not a hand? Okay. Nope. So I actually have a question. Yep. Because uh, I, just, I just Googled Erlang and microservices. And the first hit was... Uh, a guy saying, you'll never hear an Erlang programmer even talk about microservices because they're a solution to a problem that doesn't exist in the Erlang world. Would you agree with that? Yeah. What, why should we talk about microservices? Because that's what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Why should we worry, right? Well, okay. I can just say one thing. We have been reactive. We have been asynchronous. We have been uh, actors. Everything like this. We've been buzzword compliant for 25 years, right? So we, <laughs> we just don't really... <laughs> and now you're even polyglot. We're... Yes, of course. We've always been polyglot. I mean... <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. I can't get worked up about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Okay. So...